Oh. Hello. Hello, Manuel. <laughs> Oh, oh no worries at all. No worries Man, at all. <laughs> Man, well, we've had issues before with Twitter space, so please do not take this personally. This is just, you know, the, the technology is not the best, but we make it work. So thank you so much for joining us. We are so excited to have you on with us today. We're really excited for our little conversation we're about to have. So, but thank first... Oh, no worries at all. And actually, you missed Noah's great introduction of you on the previous Twitter space, and it was so great that I think you should do it again. Yes, so, okay, okay. Manuel, thank you so much again. So, as we explained to our listeners, you are the founder and chairman of the Aston Group, a private equity firm uh, with projects both in North America and Europe. You've got degrees from places including the London School of Economics and the University of Texas. But right now, you have your latest project, the... Uh, Correct me if I got this wrong, but the Querétaro Reborn Project, which is talking about mobilization in uh, Querétaro, Mexico. So we'll be sure to talk about that pretty soon. But I think, is there anything else you'd like to add about your background and who you are as a professional? Um, sure. I mean, I'm, uh, as you mentioned, I mean, I, uh, I founded the Aston Group, which is a, it's a company that basically does private equity and real estate in uh, North America and Europe. And we also um, have the Aston Foundation that helps to support, uh, you know, education for kids, uh, green spaces, and, uh, and try to help with uh, sustainability in uh, the cities that we uh, work on. That's fantastic, and we can't wait to hear more about that. And actually, Noah has a great question for you later regarding sustainability. But first, we want to get and hit on a bunch of topics, including sustainability and some of your work as a philanthropist. But we want to discuss something that is the center of our project and also an underlying issue that we've seen in Mexico. And that topic is financial literacy. So from your perspective, what is the current state of financial literacy in Mexico? Well, you know, I think Mexico has a huge education problem to start. Um, you know, the education level in Mexico is probably eighth and grade. Mm -hmm. So most uh, young kids in Mexico do not even get to go to high school. So, you know, with this level of education, you know, it's really natural to understand why there is, of course, no financial culture or financial education in the country, which is, it's, it's rather, rather high. And then, you know, the other problem that we have is that, you know, a lot of uh, different uh, business uh, people in Mexico have uh, take advantage of these and they charge, uh, you know, credit card rates or even, uh, you know, uh, stores where you can go and buy TVs and refrigerators and things like this uh, with credit. So what they do is they, for example, they provide by by weekly payments, and people really just look at how much they're paying and whether they can afford with their you know weekly check. And in most of these cases, you know, the interest rate will go you know anywhere between 20% to 100%. It is it's really really insane. It's probably illegal in some countries like Switzerland. Um, and I can send you some more information on this, but it's, it's really, really high. And even for regular credit card, I don't think there's a credit card in Mexico that will uh, give you less than 20, 30% interest rate per year. So with this, you know, a lot of people are unable to save money. And of course, they're unable to invest or work in uh, fields like the ones that you guys have. And, you know, to put it in perspective, think about how much people uh, live in Switzerland, about, you know, 8.5 million people in Mexico. We have roughly now close to 130 million people. And from this, I can guarantee you that, you know, probably more than 100 million people are really financially literate. So it's a really, really big number and it's a huge problem uh, for the country. Wow, yeah, that's definitely very insightful and gives a huge insight into the financial literacy Absolutely. problem in Mexico. And one thing that we kind of wanted to piggyback off of that question and your response is kind of, how would you like to see financial education be implemented within Mexican society? It's kind of like, what institutions do you think would be at the forefront of a movement like this when you see that financial institutions are kind of taking advantage of the financial literacy problem that's going on in Mexico? Well, I, I think it has to, you know, everything is related to education, basic education. I think schools uh, will need to learn these, uh, you know, when 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 they go to school, when, they, when uh, our children go to school uh, from very early stage, and they don't do it. I mean, I I interview and I hire a lot of uh, kids getting out of college, and even some of these kids that go to private schools, 
in many cases, they don't have really a lot of knowledge on, uh, on the financing system. And it's, uh, it's really sad. I mean, I think this has to be uh, taught since, uh, you know, elementary school. You know, a, a funny example that I, uh, I always tell is like with my kids, I sometimes come and tell me, you know, can you buy me this uh, can you for whatever, you know, 20 francs or something. And I say, okay, but I'm going to charge you a 10% for a day so you pay me back when we get back home and then they decide not to take the candy and it's really silly but you know it's, a, it's a, for me it's a good way for them to understand that you know if you're gonna be borrowing money not to borrow at some of the rates that you know we are getting in mexico because eventually you will end up losing what you bought uh and losing all your money yeah absolutely that's fantastic i uh, i love that the implementation and learning of uh, interest rates at such a young age is, is really critical <laughs> Uh, and, and honestly, it's, it's in my, uh, when I just heard that, you know, interest rates can go up as high as hundred percent. I gotta say my jaw just hit the floor. Like that is just incredibly high. And, 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 and you know, speaking of interest rates and, and going to maybe more of the, the macro situation in Mexico, you know, right now we've seen that the fed, uh, the federal reserve has raised interest rates this afternoon. Uh, today, the bank of England has raised interest rates. Um, again, and we just want to see about how does these uh, outside institutions from the U.S., maybe from Europe, how do they impact the current situation of rising rates? Um, how does that come to affect Mexico as a, as a macro economy? But also then how does that come to affect individual Mexican citizens? Well, um, Mexico is, is very dollarized in, uh, in many places. Uh, for example, uh, in Mexico, it's very, very close related to the in Canada because obviously because of the geography and then also there are different sectors for example this uh, one of the sectors that probably less money is the industrial sector and a lot of our uh, rents for the clients are in dollars and we finance these projects also uh, in a dollar based um, uh, basis so you know going or having interest rates going up so much uh, will allow you or will not allow you to develop some of these projects because you know, the, the financing is getting very, very expensive and things are getting very expensive. So when uh, the U.S. raises uh, the rates in the U.S., in Mexico, it's very likely that our central bank will follow that uh, to avoid having um, more money getting out of Mexico. So everything just becomes more expensive. And if the interest rates go up, then credit cards go up. And honestly, they're, most of the times they're not linear. I mean, they, they really raise these a lot more and you know, things become more expensive and people is unable to buy just simple goods on a daily basis yeah that's uh yeah so that, that that's um kind of hard to hear about how this kind of just multiplies over as, as it kind of extends part of the whole kind of globally connected economy uh, especially with the close relationship that the united states has with uh with mexico so we want to, uh, with our limited time, we want to shift gears a little bit because one of the things that you you, you put in your messaging and, and you talk about a lot here is, is sustainability is, is a really part of the core of, of the projects that you have. And, and here at Money Masters, we really care about that as well. And so but we also want to connect that we notice that you, you have a lot of mentorship and, and work for other entrepreneurs. And, um, and so we have a question for you about, you know, for entrepreneurs that are putting together their early products that they're looking for their, their, their bare minimum or their, their you know, bare minimum product, that uh, most viable product. Um, how can early entrepreneurs connect sustainability at the time when they're just trying to get off the ground? And what might that process look like and a way of thinking about incorporating sustainability uh, today, especially in those vital early, early years and cycles of, of a product? Um, you know, I, I think, of course, you know, when you're starting a business, uh, it's hard and you're really more looking into surviving and just, you know, funding uh, your venture but I think you know I think this is changing a lot uh, a lot a lot of people especially young people now it's a lot more uh, aware of sustainability and in many of the new business plan this is part of their uh, business plan from the beginning and there are many institutions now and banks worldwide that are really really pushing the agenda and have a lot of interest in companies that are actually uh, of pushing these in their business models so you know i will encourage any uh anyone that wants to you know start a business uh, or an application like you guys to really uh focus on that because there are again there are many many banks that are really really looking into that and in many cases uh you know some of the projects for example that we do uh, get a better financing or better rates if you actually incorporate uh, sustainability into these projects uh, for example we we have, uh, as mentioned, an industrial platform, and we have a lot of companies in the auto industry. And for 
example, these clients uh, will not be allowed to keep selling their products to uh, you know to the OEMs in Europe or in mm. the US if they don't have you know certain piece of let's say green energy by 2025. So this has, for example, pushed us to uh, start working on uh, on you know green energy in our case solar. Of course, we have a lot of sun in Mexico, so it's a great uh, source of energy and uh, and just and just push it. So I think that you know, there's a lot more money than what we think out there looking to. Uh, you know, to push the green agenda. So I, I think it's, you know, it's hard uh, if you're just thinking about the money, but if you just try to, you know, step aside a bit, uh, you know, when you're beginning and think about these a little further, I think that it will be just, uh, right now it's, it's, it's might be difficult, you're not thinking about it, but I think we'll say five to 10 years, anything that is not green related is gonna be hard to finance. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think this year alone, the International Capital Market Association predicted that we're finally going to hit one million. I'm sorry, one trillion dollar finally reach uh, for for green bond issuance. And I know the yep. um, MSCI is also predicting, you know, with its current metrics for for sustainability and equities, it seems to be kind of uh, dominating the issuance of, of financing uh, and, and really becoming a larger and larger topic. Absolutely, it is. It is, it is you know, and, and in many areas, and a lot of countries are. Uh, on infrastructure and then you know the war in ukraine really uh you know has put a lot of pressure into this as well i mean a lot of a lot of different countries want to really change uh into more uh, you know green energy and be, uh, you don't have to rely so much on uh you know on oil and gas so i mean i yeah. think that's changing i think even switzerland is trying to do uh you know this hydro hydro plant in central switzerland that is supposed to be uh you know something really really big and is going to by energy, not only for Switzerland, but some of the countries around. So um, you know, I think all the countries are really trying to work in that direction. Yeah, absolutely. So as we're kind of move, uh, moving to the final minutes here, we'd like to ask if you can give some of us uh, an explanation and some inspiration behind the, the, your upcoming project, the uh, Quetataro, the Quetataro Reborn project. Um, what's it about and your inspiration behind it? Yeah, um, you know, this, this idea really came uh, when I uh, finished uh, uh, Masters at the London School of Economics, and you know we were discussing the uh, last we saying like the green agenda, and you know how to uh, use less cars and more bicycle and pedestrianized areas, and you know look at the carbon footprint. So this is a project that I am doing pro bono myself. Uh, it's a project that will uh, help Querétaro. It's a ten-year program that will help Querétaro to pedestrianize some areas in the city. And uh, of course, we want to have you know more walkable areas, uh, more bike lines, uh, mm -hmm. more green areas, and just basically to reshape uh, the old district in Querétaro. I cannot tell you 100% of that because I'm still you know working on some details that will come out probably by the end of the year. Uh, but we have uh, a lot of uh, a lot of people really really enthusiastic about the program, and I think it could be something fantastic for the generations to come in my city. And we're really happy to hear about how this project is developing and how motivated you are to really give back to your city. And with that, Manuel, thank you so much for joining us today. We have around one minute remaining in the space and we would just, everyone at Money Masters would like to thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today, talk about the state of financial literacy in Mexico, sustainability and your upcoming projects. It's really been a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you so much guys for having me. And I usually come to Mexico, I think there's a huge opportunity for you guys there. And just look at the population, demographics are huge. So uh, you should really think about that. Absolutely. Uh, Sounds like a good time, actually. But we'll be happy to, yeah, we're looking into that. We definitely yeah. will. Very good. Thank you so much, guys, again. And uh, have a fantastic afternoon. Thank you, Manuel. You do the same. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. And sorry again for the confusion. Oh, not a problem. Yeah. So, no yeah. problem at all. I appreciate it. Bye-bye, guys. Thank you. Thank you everyone for listening.